The Holy Gospel this morning is according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter, beginning with the 10th verse. Glory to you, o Lord. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hand on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox and his donkey from the manger and lead him to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all of his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. The Gospel of the Lord. Be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Creator and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Well, here you are in a new worship site, at a new address, in a new land, a new beginning, and lots of potential. As I drove up for the first time to see your new place Friday afternoon, I immediately thought of several old homes that I have loved and renovated. Uh, they have lots of potential and it was going to take a lot of work to get them to live up to that potential. And I think that's where you find yourselves today. But you do have a lot going for you, and I'm excited for you and for your future. So I did a little research about who was using these acres before you bought them to establish this place for your church home. And from Pastor Drew, I learned that it was, you bought it from a family with two little girls who had visions of using this building as some kind of an event center, but then for whatever reasons, they decide to forsake those plans and pursue other ones. Their dream of having their daughters someday have their weddings here, however, lingers on, and perhaps that will come to pass. Well, before this couple bought this land and put these buildings on it, apparently this was open land, like we're still seeing some in this area. Uh, it was a home for wildlife and a bit of green space in a world that seems determined to turn every acre into a profit for someone somehow. And there's nothing wrong with making a profit, of course, but when profit is the main or the only motive that we consider, well, then individual lives and society can spin out of control. If we go back a century or so, we get to the people who came into this area courtesy of the Republic of Texas and the Spanish land grants. Likely, some Texas pioneer family secured one of those land grants and staked a claim for this land. And before the Europeans showed up, conquering and claiming large swaths of land for their royalty monarchs back in Europe, this land was occupied by various Native American groups. Some resources I checked said that these were the Kohalutkan, that name does not just roll off your tongue, a group of various small autonomous bands who roamed around the area hunting and gathering what they needed to care for themselves. Or it could have been the Tonkawa, Tonkawa. I saw a street not too far from here with that name on it. Or the Humanos, or even perhaps the Apache or the Comanche. Well, part of that indicates to me that the fact that we don't know for sure who was here is that it didn't seem very important to the people who were dispensing uh, information about our history, and it didn't get recorded very accurately. But the other part of that is that the Native Americans have a different understanding about land than the Europeans have had. In the under Native understanding of things, the land is a universal resource that all people need to sustain life, and so you can't carve it up into individual pieces of property and say, this is mine and not yours any more than we can do that with the air we breathe. Although I suspect it won't be long before we figure out ways to sell air as well as we now sell land and water. But today, of course, we have all sorts of legal documents and leases and permits and other legal hoops that we have to jump through, and you are encountering some of them as you try to develop this land for optimum use for your purposes. 
So even when people collectively own land as a state park or a federal uh, park or forest, uh, they're still heated and sometimes really uh, dangerous arguments about who has the right to use that land for what reasons. And so it is hard to overestimate sometimes the impact of all of this. Well, it's also hard to overestimate the impact of problems caused by COVID and still problems that are evolving from COVID. But the pandemic was actually good for the natural world. Within weeks after we all went into lockdown, we're told to go home and stay there for our own safety and for the safety of our neighbors and loved ones. Satellite images started coming in, showing that Mother Earth was already doing much better. The air was visibly cleaner, the water was cleaner, the noise pollution was reduced, people in dense urban areas were hearing birds for the first time in eons, and Mother Earth was taking a collective sigh of relief that she was getting a break from the intensity of our human use of it, the Earth. And now you are stewards of these few acres of God's good creation. You have to make changes to meet uh, the local standards and to meet your needs, uh, and, but you are still in the process of preserving these acres to provide a green space, a habitat for some wildlife that will come and occupy this with you, I do believe, and uh, to just have a place of refuge and, and sanctuary both in terms of these buildings that you have inherited from the other family uh, and in terms of the land that you will develop to your maximum use, uh, but then also leave some parts as nature has given it to you. I hope that you will not think of the finances that you have to raise to finish the projects of the outside of this area as another financial burden you have to overcome, but rather as an invitation to be in partnership with God in co-managing the wonderful creation that you have located on here. As one leader in the Lutheran Outdoor Ministry World said at a conference years ago, we must take care of the land because what we have is all we're going to get. There is no more land being created on this planet. And even though I know people are trying hard to get to Mars and beyond, I don't think we're going to be moving to Mars in our lifetime. So here you are, stewards of a small bit of Texas a short drive from the expanding metropolis of Austin, and the possibilities ahead of you are exciting. Isaiah predicted years ago, centuries ago, if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. You have a lovely home base here to heed Isaiah's words. You have been gifted with an opportunity to share this resource with the community to help people connect with God in meaningful ways and connect with your neighbors and with nature. I don't know about you, but there are days when I have to really struggle to find the bright side of signs of hope against so much distressing news that keeps coming at us every day from multiple sources. We're all looking for some light shining in the darkness of the current contentious civil discourse out there. And you have a chance to create a living sanctuary here along Bee Creek. You have already established an indoor sanctuary where people can come to worship, to be renewed, to learn, to connect with other people of faith. I love how much energy there is before worship with people catching up with each other and uh, sharing the latest news of what's going on in their life with one another. I, I think that's a really critical part of the whole reason that we have a church community at all. And now you also have a chance to turn the outdoors into an outdoor sanctuary where people who may never come into the buildings may pause and take a, a deep breath and just admire some wildlife and pull off the road for a moment, and just rest and reflect. What a gift you're offering. The word sanctuary is defined as a place of refuge or safety. You are establishing such a place for both humans and wildlife to find a place away from some of the human-made environments that keep encroaching on the habitat that they need to survive. You are preserving a place where people can come and take in the benefits of spending time in the natural world. We tend to overlook the healing qualities of the natural world. But last fall, I had a chance to go on a trip to the places where Apostle Paul once walked in Greece and Turkey. 
One of the places we toured was the Aslepion Healing Center in Pergamon in Turkey. It's named for a Greek god, the god of healing and medicine. Today, people can tour the ruins of this ancient medical health facility, but back in the day, several centuries ago, a person who was struggling with depression or anxiety or some other mental health issue could go there and be tended to by an escort who would walk them through the facilities. And part of the path would go through a long tunnel that had a series of gentle steps and along one edge of those steps, there was a stream of water running down the hill. And so they would walk through this tunnel and listen to the sound of the water rushing through the tunnel. And then at the end of the tunnel, they would be on a path that would go around and around a large circular building. And the purpose of all of this was that they believed it was easier to talk about some of our troubles if we were walking. Uh, and accompanied by somebody who would listen carefully and, and uh, hear our story, but also to the soothing sound of running water. That was the healing message of the centuries ago in Greece, and I think we still all sometimes feel better. I know you're close to a lake here. I imagine all of you enjoy going to that lake. Uh, I grew up along a lake. I know that I am personally soothed anytime I am near water. Nature has many healing qualities that we tend to overlook in our fast-paced world. So what a marvelous opportunity you have with this land to plant the seeds of hope for all who will come here, even if they only come here by passing by on Bee Creek. The healing is the theme of today's text, and with this land you have the opportunity to offer healing in new and creative ways. You have the resource of land to offer healing for the mind, the soul, and the body. The healing is not just for humans, but also for the natural world that groans for relief from the many abuses that we humans have inflicted on it. We modern people are so disconnected from the natural world that we don't even realize our very lives actually depend on the earth. Until we experience catastrophic droughts and wildfires and floods, then we began to tune in and pay attention. I am not making this up. I have actually had people tell me that they feel badly about the challenges that farmers and ranches are facing from severe weather, but it's not really a concern to them because they get their food from the local grocery store. It is such a sad commentary that we are that disconnected. <laughs> but then we have the example of Martin Luther who wrote, even if I knew that tomorrow the world would go to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. And we have the story of Jesus healing the woman who has been over for 18 years. And she comes on the Sabbath because she apparently has heard that Jesus will be there. And Jesus goes ahead and heals her after her 18 years of misery on the Sabbath and then incurs the wrath of the religious leaders of the day. However, he is, he's very aware of the importance of Sabbath and our need for rest and, and not trying to go 24-7, but he's also aware of the need for this woman to also be healed so that she too can enjoy a Sabbath rest, free of the discomfort of walking around parallel to the ground. At a text study that I go to in Houston this week, one of the pastors uh, was talking about this text with us, and he said how grateful he was that when he collapsed after a worship service that uh, was handed off to the hospital by the EMT, God, how grateful he was that the EMT squad and the doctors and the lab people and everyone else at the hospital were all working that Sabbath so that he could be restored to health. So the land also needs a sabbatical. We need a few acres of land that are not developed. We need places to observe the world the way God created it. And now you control a few of those acres. You can use them as a sanctuary for people and wildlife alike. I can envision many moments of healing taking place at this address, both inside the buildings that you've converted to a center for worship and a place for study and meetings and fellowship. I can imagine many conversations that will happen here that will strengthen relationships and speak encouraging words to people who are having a rough time of it. And equally important, I can imagine you using your outdoor space where people can just pause to absorb some natural beauty and take a deep breath from the busyness of their life. 
Even people just driving past on Bee Creek will notice a bit of green space here, inviting them to slow down and appreciate the view. So it seems to me that the Spirit is very much working with and in and through your congregation as you establish yourselves into these hills. Now we need to raise the funds for the necessary upgrades so that you are good neighbors in the Spicewood community and so that you are doing what you can to protect and preserve these sacred acres. The Seas of Hope campaign will unfold much like the other one that we did together a few years ago. We'll start with a period of 10 days of prayer. That starts this week. You'll be getting a mailing with a brochure with 10 suggestions for daily things to focus on. And you'll be uh, getting some information from Pastor Drew and from others about those. So we're just asking that you set aside just a few minutes, maybe five minutes a day, to read through those petitions and to reflect on them in your own way. There will be opportunities to get more specific information about the need for the campaign, the, the upgrades that you must do to the facilities, and also some of the plans for the future of these facilities. Uh, so be, you'll get invitations to some information meetings, and you'll get information in your mailbox, you'll get information in your uh, email inbox. Uh, if you don't know what's going on, it's because you have chosen to not know what's going on, because we're going to bombard you with information. So there will be opportunities to gather and learn, but I think we're probably all a bit nervous about the economy these days. It is truly a roller coaster. It's risky indeed to try and guess what the stock market is going to be doing a week from now. Uh, and so we do need to be responsible stewards of our financial resources too. And yet, God has not gone away or forgotten God's people. Isaiah spoke wisely when he wrote, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land, and he will strengthen your frame. You will be a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail, and your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and raise up an age-old foundation. The age-old foundation has not changed in all the centuries from when Isaiah lived to the present time in the 21st century. We make discerning and carrying out God's will for us and those around us our top priority and trust that God will continue to provide what we need. No one will be pressured to do more than is good for your personal economic situation in the course of this campaign, but we will ask that you faithfully and prayerfully consider what part you can play in providing for the best care possible for this land that you now occupy. And as you go on your way from here today, know that Christ goes with you, before you to show you the way, beside you to befriend you, behind you to encourage you, above you to watch over you, and most of all within you to give you peace. Amen. <laughs>